My mother was always my best friend. She taught me about the individual strains, the individual way to fertilize or to care for each one. She said that you can't buy TLC in a jug. It comes from within and each individual plant really has its own identity. And you build a relationship with each plant. Every single one of those plants needs individual care. She was really known for having the green thumb and eventually she became to be known in this community as being one of the best cannabis growers in the whole county. I learned everything in life that I value today from my mother and my parents. And even though at times it didn't mean a whole lot then, it's really only now that it holds the meaning that it does and it is who I am today. We lived in secrecy for 30, 40 years, and it was hard because we always worried that, can we tell this person, can't we tell that person? And there was times when the aerial surveillance got so bad, Ronald Reagan had declared the war on drugs, and there was four or five helicopters in there. We were climbing fir trees and, and oak trees, and we built platforms, and we were growing in trees because they would always look on the ground. So we figured if we grew in the trees that, you know, they wouldn't be seeing them. Even to this day, you'll notice that people that grew up here, when they hear a helicopter flying, they get quiet, they'll listen, they'll look. It's, uh, you know, some PTSD for sure. In 1992, when I was 24 years old, I got uh, busted with my best friend growing cannabis. This to me was a plant. This, this plant was the same as a tomato plant was to me. And I know that sounds really weird, but that's how I felt about a plant. I didn't think this plant could ever hurt anybody. I personally would never hurt anybody and never bring any harm to anybody, so I felt pretty good about who I was. I was charged for conspiracy to cultivate marijuana. From that point forward, for the next three years, we went down to the San Francisco Federal Courthouse building where we denied to have a, a jury trial because we thought we didn't want to cost the taxpayer any more money and we wanted to really share with the judge not that we weren't guilty for growing the cannabis. We did tell them, we, you know, we were growing the cannabis, but we want you to know who we are as people. Because I just thought it was so important and so unbelievable that I could actually go to jail for growing a plant. It didn't matter who we were as people, it mattered what bracket, which was plant count, our plant count was 1,024 plants. 526 of those plants were pulled out of the brush in six-pack, 72-pack trays that were this big. For them, it was about making money. It was about securing jobs. It was about federal funds. So the more they got at the end of the year, they would get as much money, or if not more money, the following year. And we got 10 years in jail for a first-time nonviolent offender. In federal sentencing, you have to do 85% of your time. So I did eight out of the 10 years in federal prison and then had five years probation. So there was a time during the trial where the prosecutor offered to give me no time at all if I would cooperate with them and, and give up somebody. And I think a person really has to truly evaluate who they are inside. And for me, it was always about this community. It was always about my friends. A year to the day that I was in jail, I heard my name come over from the chapel's office and, you know, I, I knew that wasn't anything good. And, you know, I was informed from the chaplain that, you know, something bad had happened. My mom had had an accident and she was no longer growing cannabis. She had left and she bought a 90-foot commercial albacore boat and she was sailing around the world with my stepdad. Um, commercial fishing because that was her true love was the, living on the ocean. That was a really tough time by yourself in jail and it was really this community, the support from them, the letters that I received that helped me still keep an eye on the light at the end of the tunnel and, and realize that when I came out that even though some of my family wasn't going to be there that my extended family, this community was going to be there. So being away in jail and, 
in really making the decision not to turn anybody in and really to value somebody else's life as much as I valued mine was really rebuilding trust with this community that I'm a man of my word, I am who I said I was, and in doing the right thing, I was trying to figure out a way because my mom had taught me everything I knew on how to really honor her. And so I came up with the idea, since I was following it around since I was 10, growing a strain that she created with my best friend, that it was vitally important to the, make this farm reflect a little bit of her. And so every strain that I grow here today are strains that I've created from a strain I used to grow with her back 45 years ago. While I was gone, the only way I was able to keep those genetics alive was my best friend kept a male plant of her genetics in a little closet underneath a light. And I have that plant here today. And so every different strain, even though it might be crossed with an OG or it might be crossed with a Skittles, there's a little piece of mom and a little piece of her legacy here on this farm. And We've created little special things. I have a, a thing called, I call it the Farmer's Mountain. And it's really a celebration of farmers in the Emerald Triangle that have been growing most of their life and really represent our county in, in the best possible way and grow amazing cannabis. There's little burls with a couple sentences that they submitted to me about their values or about their beliefs. The one saying that we all typically say is it's never gonna be about one of us, it's always gonna be about all of us. And in pursuing our own dreams or our own hopes for our brands, we always all keep in mind that it's always about all of us. It's never really been about making money for me. It's always been about really making a difference in people's lives. And, and when people started coming here and media started to get interested in my story and why this, this 20 year old kid got sentenced to 10 years for growing a plant as a first time offender, you know, watching their reactions when they came to this farm and being able to change their perspective on who we are as, as the Emerald Triangle, as a community, you know, the cannabis is some of the best cannabis in the world and people come from all over for the cannabis, but they move here for this community. This community is magical in ways you can't describe that you can only experience to really know the specialty of it. This year, one of our signature strains is a strain called Whitethorn Rose. I do have a strain called Mom's Weed, Sweet Marlene and Amalfi are, are the main strains that I'm growing this year. That was really dictated by the consumer feedback that I got from last year as being their favorites. The thing that really truly differentiates our product from big ag product where they're really growing for profit is that we don't just pour things from a jug into a tank. TLC doesn't come in a jug. TLC comes from me touching every plant, touching every leaf, finding stuff in the forest, mycelium, and introducing it into the planter boxes or into the beds that I'm growing what that takes to nurture that plant. I have a relationship with each one, so you'll hear farmers talk about at the end of the year really struggling with cutting those plants down because we're not so much growing for profit, we're growing for that recognition, that validation, and that feedback from the consumer that we've never had before. And knowing that that consumer is, is really consuming the best possible product in its best possible form, because I can grow the best possible product, but if it doesn't get to them in its best possible form, preserved in its best possible way, it kind of defeats the purpose of what I'm doing here every day. As a farmer, I can grow it, I can cure it, I can take care of it perfectly, but once it leaves the farm here, I lose a little bit of control. The degradation of terpenes and THC and cannabinoids can still happen in the jar, so you can't take it for granted that that jar is gonna sell. So we're now incorporating a terpene shield into the jars to really let us sleep well at night knowing that that consumer is, is really consuming the best possible product in its best possible form. This is why Bovida is such an important part. They're not only making an important part in the product that we're bringing to market, but they're making a difference in educating the consumer about who we are as people and, and what our legacy is all about. There's gonna be an aha moment. I, I promise you that. If there's one thing I know is there'll be an aha moment down the road where they go, my God, sun-grown craft cannabis is amazing. It makes me feel so good. There's something amazing about to happen and, and we're gonna be part of it. Having gone to jail and I saw so many bitter and angry people, you know, blaming the government, I just really realized very quickly that I don't want to be like that. 
that's not going to be who I am. That's not going to be the kind of person I am because what I did was against the law. I was breaking the law. Whether or not I deserved to get that much time, we could all argue about, but it really created the person that I am today. And I'm so grateful that I am who I am today and that I have a platform that I can not only share Huckleberry Hill and what this place stands for, but what this community stands for, what this community went through to really create this industry that we're in today.